I've been saying for the last year and a half that the best thing we can do, politically speaking, is let Obamacare explode. It is exploding right now. Close, but not good enough. President Trump and GOP leaders pulled the plug on the plan to repeal the Affordable Care Act. Good evening, and thanks for joining us. I'm Ebony Monet. Obamacare may be sticking around for a while, says House Majority Leader Paul Ryan. He spoke to reporters today, minutes before pulling the GOP health care overhaul bill before its scheduled vote. The bill didn't have the support it needed to pass. You've all heard me say this before. Moving from an opposition party to a governing party comes with growing pains. And, well, we're feeling those growing pains today. We came really Democrats are calling it a victory for Americans, especially seniors, people with disabilities, and veterans. Here's House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi. It's not just about the 24 million people who now won't have be off of the uh, health insurance. It's about the 155 million people who receive their health benefits uh, in the workplace who will not be assaulted by some of the provisions that the Republicans put in the bill, especially last night when they removed the essential benefits uh, package. San Diego Democratic representatives took a victory lap on Twitter today. Scott Peters and Juan Vargas also released statements saying they want to move forward and improve the health care system already in place. The failure of the overhaul bill is a setback for President Trump and GOP leaders. They've been promising to repeal the Affordable Health Care Act since it was signed seven years ago. Today, state senators gathered in San Diego to discuss how the Republicans' plan for health care reform could affect Californians. That plan failed today, but KPBS reporter David Wagner says California Democrats are still concerned about the future of health care in the state. Well, the Republicans' plan to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act fell apart today, but California Democrats say they're pushing ahead with a plan that aims to cover Californians if Obamacare is eventually repealed. State Senator Tony Atkins is co-sponsoring a bill to explore the possibility of setting up a single-payer health care system in California. We spoke with her earlier today here at San Diego State University, where she took part in a hearing about health care policy. I think this is still timely to proceed forward and, and do the work we need to do um, to make sure that we are going to have universal coverage for everyone, single payer. Atkins and State Senator Ed Hernandez heard from health policy experts and patients at today's hearing, and they highlighted the 5 million Californians who've received coverage through Obamacare. They said that with the possibility of repeal still in play, California needs a backup plan to cover those people, plus those who remain without insurance. David Wagner, KPBS News. Planned Parenthood was singled out in the Republicans' effort to repeal and op replace Obamacare. KPBS health reporter Kenny Goldberg went to a rally in Balboa Park today where hundreds of people showed their support for the organization. The Republican plan would have eliminated federal funding for Planned Parenthood for one year. That would have been a major blow. California's Planned Parenthood clinics would have lost more than $170 million in federal Medicaid funds. Erin Panichko lives in National City. Planned Parenthood protects our sexual health and our reproductive decisions. And volunteers with the local chapter. She says Republicans just don't like what Planned Parenthood stands for. And I think it really comes down to power and control. You know, controlling women's bodies, women's decisions. You know, we don't have the same conversations around men's health care or vasectomies. Those who supported cutting off public money for Planned Parenthood said community clinics could have picked up the slack. Planned Parenthood's vice president, Nora Vargas, says that's nonsense. They cannot absorb the number of patients that we see. We see over 850,000 patients in California uh, a year. A recent poll from the Kaiser Family Foundation reveals 75 percent of Americans say they favor continued funding for Planned Parenthood. From Balboa Park, Kenny Goldberg, KPBS News. We continue to examine the fallout over the Republican health care plan. We will have more analysis tonight on what this means for President Trump on PBS NewsHour, and we'll follow any developments on air and online at kpbs.org. San Diego is a step closer to regulating short-term home rentals. KPBS Metro reporter Andrew Bowen says the city council 
on a land use took up the issue today. The City Council is considering three options for regulating short-term rentals made popular by websites like Airbnb. All the options require a permit from the city and more accountability from the property owners. And the three options differ in how strict the permitting process would be. Committee members heard hours of public testimony for and against allowing short-term rentals. Supporters say they're a vital part of the sharing economy, while opponents say they often disrupt quiet residential neighborhoods. Councilman Scott Sherman says a blanket ban would punish responsible Airbnb hosts for the bad actions of just a few. You can have a rehab facility next door. You can have a daycare next door. All these things cause just as much noise and just as, just as much disruption if they're not managed properly. The city staffers need time to draft the proposed ordinance language, so the regulations aren't likely to get a final vote before late summer. Andrew Bowen, KPBS News. Tri-City Medical Center in Oceanside has obtained an $85 million loan backed by the federal government. KPBS North County reporter Allison St. John says the money will help the health care district get out from under its long-term debt and start building new facilities. Tri-City has been approved for $85 million in long-term financing backed by the Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD. In a press release, the chair of the publicly elected Tri-City Board, Jim D'Agostino, said the financing will, quote, enable our health care district to be seismically compliant by 2030. Tri-City has failed three times to get North County voters to approve bond measures for upgrades. The district has been under a financial cloud. District spokesman David Bennett says the low interest loan will secure the medical center's future. The 85 million is the long-term guaranteed loans we got. Now that frees up about 51 million dollars of cash that we've had used as collateral for loans that go back 10 years. Bennett says the first step will be to build a new parking structure and a new emergency department. He says the district may have to go back to HUD for more financing for the seismic upgrades. Allison St. John, KPBS News. New parents would get as many as 12 weeks off work without risking losing their jobs under a new bill making its way through the Capitol. Proponents say giving parents ample time with their newborn children is critical to both that child's and their parents' health. I think certainly we, we see that women in particular are impacted by uh, the requirements of small employers to come back to work immediately, not giving them the time uh, to bond with their children, uh, to nurse their children. We know that um, if, we, uh, if women were given, tw up, uh, were given 12 weeks to bond with their, their newborns, we'd reduce postpartum depress depression by about a third. So that's significant. The rule would imply to employees of companies with 20 to 49 employees. Employees with bigger companies are already protected under the law. We examine Donald Trump's proposed spending plan, which has some good news for veterans and local defense industries, and some pretty bad news for scientists, the environment, and affordable housing. We sort it all out on the roundtable tonight at 8.30. California Senator Kamala Harris joins the growing list of Democrats who say Judge Neil Gorsuch will not get her vote. She and Washington Senator Patty Murray say the Denver-based appeals court judge has ruled too often against workers in favor of big business. Other senators have argued Gorsuch hasn't proven he'd be an independent voice against President Trump. Still, Republicans have the majority and are expected to ensure Gorsuch's a seat in the nation's highest court. In tonight's Marketplace report, we take a look at how the judge's legal philosophy could make or break rulings on American businesses. Supreme Court confirmation hearings are currently underway for Judge Neil Gorsuch, but who is he? And what would his appointment mean for American business? When Justice Scalia passed away suddenly last February, I made a promise to the American people. I would find the very best judge in the country for the Supreme Court. He's been called Scalia 2.0 for his conservative legal philosophies and originalist interpretation of the Constitution. I never felt my arguments to courts were political ones, but ones based on rules of procedure and evidence, precedent, 
standard interpretive techniques. His most high-profile business case came in 2013 by way of the craft store chain Hobby Lobby. The company's owners argued that the employer provided contraceptive services were against their religious beliefs. The case made it all the way to the Supreme Court, where in a 5-4 to four decision, justices agreed with the ruling previously set by Gorsuch and the Tenth Circuit Court in Colorado. Defending the decision, he said, Congress has defined person to include corporation. So you can't rule out the possibility that some companies can exercise religion. Top-ranking Democrats suggest that Gorsuch would favor big business over the individual worker and are pointing to specific cases from his past, like Trans Am versus the Department of Labor, when a truck driver was fired by his employer for refusing to drive his 18-wheeler during a snowstorm. The administrative law judge ruled that firing the driver was a violation of the health and safety law intended to protect workers. The United States Department of Labor's Administrative Review Board and the Tenth Circuit agreed. Judge Gorsuch dissented and sided with the company. I've been stuck on the highway in Wyoming in a snowstorm. I know it's involved. I don't make light of it. I take it seriously. But Senator, this gets back to what my job is and what it isn't. And if we're going to pick and choose cases out of 2,700, I can point you to so many in which I have found for the plaintiff in an employment action or affirmed a finding of an agency of some sort for a worker or otherwise. As with all Supreme Court nominations, this boils down to partisan politics. Uh, Judge Gorsuch has spent more than a decade on the federal bench. He graduated from Harvard Law School. He clerked for the Supreme Court. He served the, in the Department of Justice. All things very positive for a Supreme Court nominee. And if all those things I've read were sufficient reason to confirm a nominee to the Supreme Court, of course, Chief Judge Merrick Garland, who had exactly the same qualifications, but was refused by the Republicans, would be sitting on the court today. As for Gorsuch, he just wants to do his job and hopes that the Senate will be looking beyond the partisan politics. Long before we're Democrats or Republicans or Americans. You can tune in to Marketplace on KPBS Radio weekday mornings during Morning Edition and also at 3 p.m. and 6.30 p.m. Paving the way for a new bicycle track, the San Diego Velodrome is getting new pavement. A little rain delayed construction. Now workers won't be done until next week. Hopefully it won't rain on their parade again. Sinead Shocker has the forecast. Rounds of rain are continuing into central and northern California. We're also getting some snow out towards the Sierras here. A look at your satellite radar going to show you just that. Now further off towards the south around southern California, you can see bands of clouds moving in and we are going to be looking at a little bit of wet weather. But uh, over the past six hours, not quite seeing too much at all. Into tonight, we'll see some clouds moving into the region. 57 degrees for the metro area. And then we pop around San Diego County for tonight. Into the mountains we go. We're in those low 40s. Mount Laguna, 37 degrees. And Borrego Springs in those mid-50s. And we're also out towards the mid-50s into Oceanside. So a fairly mild evening for us here. And particularly out towards the mountains. For tomorrow, we're going to see that dip in the jet stream bringing chances of a spotty shower, but much of that wet weather is going to be held out towards areas just off towards the east of the Great Basin, areas in Utah, some snow showers as well out there towards the higher elevations and into Northern California. A couple of showers going to be affecting them there. Early next week, however, that rain, though it is going to stay put, is going to stay off towards our north. So the Great Basin seeing some showers as well as some snow into the Sierras, and that's going to continue to track eastward as we head throughout the rest of our time here. But Southern California not looking too bad into early next week as you head back to work. We're looking at partly sunny skies here on our Monday and uh, looks like Saturday as I said for tomorrow. A couple of showers around but we're not so much looking at uh, extremely wet weather. Tuesday into Wednesday temperatures are going to climb into the upper 60s and then finally back into those 70s as well. Further inland temperature is going to be just a touch warmer as we head into our weekend. If you want to get outdoors, well, Sunday is probably the better day to do it, but Saturday won't be too bad either. Temperature is climbing as we head into early in the middle of next week. We're going to be into the 80s on our Wednesday, so very, very warm weather here. And then we 
head out towards the mountains. While cooler conditions, obviously, overnight lows for Monday are going to drop right around that freezing mark. It's going to be quite windy as well with that system passing through. So high-profile vehicles are going to want to pay attention to any wind advisories in effect. Into Tuesday, looking at 53 degrees, we are going to see plenty of sunshine, however, and Wednesday climbing back into the 60s. So we are heading towards more spring-like temperatures. And then into the deserts, we're looking at climbing near the 90 degree mark on Wednesday. We'll be looking at sunny skies with a high of 86. For KPBS News, I'm Shanae Shocker. San Diego County's employment rate has almost rebounded from the recession. Today, the Employment Department released January numbers. The unemployment rate is 4.2 percent, down from a year ago when it was 4.8. San Diego workers are faring better than workers in other, part, in, in other parts of the state. California's unemployment rate is 5.2 percent. While minimum wage workers in San Diego recently saw their pay go up, those raises don't apply to the rest of the county. A new report finds residents in National City and Imperial Beach are struggling to make ends meet. KPBS reporter Claire Tregesser has more. In both cities, many residents don't earn enough to pay for housing, food, and other necessities. In National City, more than 21 percent of people were living below the federal poverty level in 2015, which is around $24,000 for a family of four. In Imperial Beach, that number was almost 25 percent. That's compared to just under 14 percent in all of San Diego County. In both cities, the median income in 2015 was around $44,000 a year, way below the median in all of San Diego County. Those numbers come from a report by the advocacy organization Center on Policy Initiatives. It found that residents in other South Bay cities are also struggling. While Chula Vista's poverty rate is much lower at around 10 percent, people there are also struggling to make ends meet. Uh, it's difficult. Um when your children want something, not need, but want something, and you're unable to provide that for them. That includes Liliana Robles, mom to three boys in Chula Vista. They eat a lot. <laughs> they eat a lot. It's expensive. It's very difficult. Um, I say that us moms have to see beyond the struggle and make the impossible happen. She works as an office manager, but is currently out of a job. Her husband's income as a plumber isn't enough for the family to get by. Most people nowadays use more than 30 percent of their income for housing, and that's, that's unacceptable, I think. I mean, to, to think 50, 60, 70 percent, it's, it's a lot of your income, if not most of it. So what money do I have left over to give my children what they want? Zero. Zero. And it's very difficult. While the city of San Diego recently raised its minimum wage, that isn't true for other county residents like Robles. She says the 50 cent increase in the state minimum wage wasn't enough. That rises, so does the cost of living. You know, it rises just as the same, if not more. So she's been volunteering at the advocacy group Alliance of Californians for Community Empowerment to fight for a bigger wage bump and rent control. Claire Tregesser. KPBS News. San Diego County has lost 3,500 affordable units in the past 20 years and risks losing more than 2,000 in the next five years. That's according to a new report from the nonprofit California Housing Partnership. KPBS North County reporter Allison St. John says a nonprofit developer is working to reverse that trend. This 200-unit low-income apartment complex was run down and on the market two years ago. Luckily for the residents, a nonprofit developer bought it for $25 million with the help of federal tax credits. 30 units, you know, here and 60 units there. Ann Wilson is with the developer that bought it, Community Housing Works. If someone else had purchased this property, Escondido would have lost 200 really nice apartments. I mean, they, they, they're nice now. They weren't that nice when we purchased them because we renovated them. But 200 families would have lost affordable housing. That's a big number for a city of this size. Mariella Johnson has lived here for 15 years and brought up two daughters. This is my two daughters. This is my husband. When she first moved in, she only had to wait a month to get into this unit. Now the waiting list for a unit in this complex is two to four years. 
Her rent is just over $900 for this two-bedroom apartment, and she knows she could not afford to move out. Market rate rents for a unit like this are around $1,500. She's pleased with the renovations that Community Housing Works has made, like new windows. They replaced all the fencing and the wooden balconies. The fences are new. Um, they paint all, all the walls. Uh, they paint all our kitchen. For Johnson, the most important improvements were to security. In every single apartment, they have a door light. Too. The security gates that were broken now work, and there are security cameras in every courtyard. So the cameras are filming all the time, 24 hours, so they know who come inside and who leave the property. So it's very good. It's very, I feel very secure in here. Mm -hmm. So this is our community center. This is in a building that existed when we took over the property, but it was completely shuttered. The kids called it the haunted house because it wasn't doing anything here. Silvia Martinez, the project manager with Community Housing Works, says they've invested $8.3 million in renovations. So we've reopened, revitalized this area, and it's going to be full of kids. It's going to be here on behalf of the community. Martinez says Community Housing Works is investing in more than bricks and mortar. The developer is also committed to building a healthy community here. So we do work a lot with school-age kids on school success, on enrichment, around literacy. Um, which is a prime factor in knowing that kids are going to succeed in later years, um, as well as other uh, computer technology access. You know, we have the computer room behind me. Renovations included new roofs, new plumbing, and solar hot water. In one of the courtyards, solar panels shade a recreation area next to a new soccer field. You can't keep kids away from balls, but you want to make sure they're doing it in a safe place. <laughs> and we have to provide new. Wilson says if a for-profit developer had bought this apartment complex, the $8 million spent on upgrades would likely have gone to investors as profits. So this was something that somebody, a private company would have purchased, put minimal rehab in, waited 15 years, raised the rents, effectively evicting any of the low-income residents, converted it to market rate, and probably sold it at a much higher profit. Um, community housing works. We have to be just as good a real estate developer. We're real estate developers. We have to do everything they do except like Ginger Rogers in high heels and backwards. So we have to compete with them in the market to, to get these opportunities. Then we have to go out and find the financing to keep it affordable and we invest those profits that for them would go to shareholders back into renovations. Wilson says it's much less expensive to renovate than to build new because you don't have to go through community approvals and rezoning. She says California law gives cities credit for how many new homes they plan to build for low-income families, but few incentives to preserve the housing they already have. Allison St. John, KPBS News. Coming up tonight on PBS NewsHour, a cult classic returns to the silver screen with a wee bit of baggage. The joys of doing the film was the learning process of seeing how poorly men age and how wise women are. Whereas we, it's not even like we think we're living in the past, we just are and we're not admitting it to ourselves. Plus, should corporations sponsor social justice causes? A contemporary art manager questions their motives. That's tonight on PBS NewsHour, starting at 7, right here on KPBS. Calling Dr. Ruth to help amphibians make a love connection. Like the other famous doctor sharing her name, Dr. Ruth Marsak is somewhat of a sex therapist. The reproductive physiologist is helping the Detroit Zoo fight the amphibian extinction crisis. The Detroit Zoo would like to see toads hang around as long as possible. It is very much a crisis. Um, it's actually nicknamed the amphibian extinction crisis. Which is why it hired Dr. Ruth. Ruth Marsek heads up the zoo's National Amphibian Conservation Center. There's a guy on top of one here. Where part of her job is to help newts, frogs, and salamanders make a love connection. Amphibians are very difficult to breed in captivity. Uh, you need to get the mood just right. They need, you know, some Marvin Gaye. Um, no, they, they need specific barometric pressure. They need specific rainfall, things like that. Marsek is both a veterinarian and a reproductive physiologist. These are beautiful. Making her uniquely qualified to address what has become a critical situation. If you combine all the endangered 
mammals and birds, that still doesn't add up to the percentage of amphibians that are threatened and endangered. Marsec, who assists zoos and other institutions across the U.S. with their amphibian breeding efforts, does so because of the crucial role the little critters play. Amphibian larvae, the tadpoles and the, the baby salamanders, um, they keep water healthy. Salamanders keep soil healthy and aerated. If you removed the salamanders from the Appalachian Mountains, the forests would die. Plus, she's smitten. A lot of people don't recognize how adorable they are. There we go. So whether she's inducing salamanders to do their sexy dance, or playing a tree frog breeding call on a tablet computer, Dr. Ruth is bringing her sex expertise to the amphibian world. Mike Householder, Associated Press, Royal Oak, Michigan. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.